Hello, Delila. Hello, Lady Mariam. Thank you so much for being with us. Great to be here. Thank you, Hala. Um, you, you both believe, just like Solve does actually, that talent and equal, uh, is equally distributed out there, but opportunity is not. And you both believe, like Solve, that technology can be an equalizer and even more so a way out, uh, our path to social and economic mobility. And you both have dedicated so much of your professional life to closing the digital divide as a means to a possible future, to a better future. So I'm so delighted to have both of you um, with us today. Uh, Mariam, Lady, Lady M, can I start <laughs> with you? <laughs> it's a new title, I don't know where it's come from, but it's a new title apparently I should use, so. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's a lovely title. It's a very well-deserved one. You are the founder of I Am The Code. It's a bold, ambitious goal to enable 1 million girls to become coders by 2030. Mm -hmm. And you go where no one else goes, to the most under-resourced communities in the world, uh, refugee camps, favelas, Take us with you to uh, Kakuma for a moment. How, how did your own life journey lead you here? Well, first of all, you know, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of, of Solve and MIT Solve. So I really love what you guys are doing. I always dreamt to be one of the MIT Solve, MIT Solve ladies. So, <laughs> so well, no, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> So yeah, I think I think my journey really started. Um, you know, maybe most of you don't know uh, who are watching. My journey started in Senegal, in West Africa, so that's where I started. Um, and uh, I was born in a, a from a, you know an aristocrat family. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, when we were five years old, my mother had to uh, you know abandon us as children. So I've got a twin brother. Um, and uh, I suffered terribly as a child. Uh, and and when I was um, 11 years old, I was sexually abused by my Quranic teacher. So my country is a Muslim country. And so that, that then, uh, you know, stopped me going to school. I, I didn't go to school, so I never had any, any education myself. And I uh, really went, um, had a very, very tough, um, tough upbringing uh, from foster home to foster home. Uh, my, my country, Senegal, in 1970s, society was uh, really not favorable for women and girls. So my mother couldn't make the right choices for her self and and now she has died um i'm starting to realize now what happened to her and why she did what she did to us and when i was 13 years old i was trafficked from senegal to france so i, I was my suffering and my my you know my, my dilemma continued and um i really didn't have a you know starting to get things started to get a slightly better when i was in france when i got picked up by the french police in in france and so I had a really, very really tough life. And I think that what is led, leading me right now to do what I do, because I believe that systems are what is making things difficult for boys and girls across the world. And uh, I just didn't want, um, you know, carry on seeing the pain and the difficulty, uh, you know, boys and girls are having, especially young girls growing up in, in the world. And so this passion has really driven me to, uh, you know, talk to government and private sector and, and people to, Pay attention a little bit to, to human beings because, you know, people like us, uh, we do grow up uh, and when we grow up, we, you know, we want to have a space in, in the world. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here today, uh, you know, talking to you, uh, you know, you amazing people, if somebody didn't hold my hand and help me. But it takes a long time. It takes years and years and years. I mean, my, I'm nearly 50 years old. So we need to start really investing very early uh, if we don't want to damage people psychologically, but also, uh, you know, forget them. So that's what led me to go to Kakumo Refugee Camp, which I find out, uh, you know, through my work, uh, you know, at the UN. I got nominated last two years, three years ago, uh, you know, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and UNICEF, really to look into uh, sustainable development goals. Ten years from now, what is the data look like? Uh, you know, who's going to be uh, sitting, talking to you? Uh, who, wh what are the voices we are hearing? Uh, and, and like I said, you know, a young girl today who's 11 years old, like I was uh, when I was sexually abused, do grow up uh, with a lot of baggages and mental issues. So if we, if we sorted out our society before, um, you know, intervene and, and prevent uh, all of this, this pain, unnecessary uh, difficulty and pains, so I think we can do something better. So that's why I go to Kakumo refugee camp where there are over 200 uh, refugees 
uh, Boys and Girls, uh, and then, you know, I Am The Code is the first organization to actually address these issues to make sure that boys and girls in that camp uh, know that we haven't forgotten about them. Yes, they are refugees, uh, but it's not their fault. It's the system of their countries. And so I just want that as an African sister, because they are refugees in their own continent, uh, just to show them that I can, I learn how to code and, and you know, seven coded languages here in my house in, in Surrey. Uh, now I'm in a privileged position. I've never thought I'm going to be here, uh, that I want to help them out. So maybe 10 years from now, they can also make a difference in the life of order. So that's what my my story is really in short. Wow, thank you. I mean, this is so powerful. I think you 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 describe it as from nothing to disrupting. And uh, I think, you know, and you say beautifully that you have, you come from this difficult background and you arrive without forgetting where you came from and you go back there to elevate others with you. Um, thank you for sharing uh, with us such a such a personal story, and thank you for for what you do and how you've turned your pain into um, into healing for others. Really, um, uh, so I'm I'm going to now shift to uh, Delilah. Uh, you have also dedicated your career to digital inclusion. Uh, your vantage point is very different. It's this huge Fortune 50 company. Uh, you command an enormous platform in the US, uh, a family of brands, the technology, the people in the thousands. Um, this work is primarily in the US, um, where we're also uh, going through a long overdue reckoning around American uh, racism. And you, as a person of uh, color, you have been just such a, um, uh, such a model for so many. I, I, I also want to hear from you how you, how you got here. Thank you, Hala. Again, just honored to be here um, and just honored also to, to, to be here with Lady Mariam and to hear her story and she's inspired so many, um, including myself. Uh, my, my parents actually met in the Vietnam War, so my father's an African American, uh, was a soldier for the Air Force. My mom uh, is Vietnamese and I grew up on the south side of Chicago. And so while we didn't have a lot, I had two parents that believed in my education and they weren't afraid for me to try things and learn things that they weren't necessarily exposed to. So while I could have never envisioned, you know, I would be here at a Fortune 50 company today, um, you know, they, they encouraged me to take risks and really sort of let me believe that I could do anything. And that makes a huge difference for young people. You know, if you're constantly hearing that you can't do things, um, it's really hard to overcome that. And so it started with my parents and I was fortunate to be in a number of different environments to con continue to excel. Um, I started my career in banking and I was on the, the business side uh, doing a number of different efforts in finance, mergers and acquisitions, and ultimately moved over to the, to the philanthropy side of the house um, and was there for 17 years before I joined Comcast and BC Universal. So um, uh, it was just a great background. And, and again, I, I didn't even know this job existed you know, when I left business school. And I think the, the power of our industry today and, and private sector companies really recognizing, as well as our customers and investors and stakeholders, the role we have and how accountable we are um, in bringing what we have to offer as a business uh, to service communities, I think is huge. And people recognize that more today than ever before. You know, when I'm talking to any company about you know, how do you come together and figure out what it is you're going to dedicate yourself to? You know, you start with the business purpose and you start with your expertise because that's exactly where you're going to have the ability to, to differentiate it, you know, to impact that area in a differentiated way. And for us, being the largest broadband company here and having the benefit of our platforms through Comcast, NBC, Universal, our theme parks around the world, and of course, Sky. Um, we know that broadband is something we do well. We're always continuing to build out our network. And it was, it was the first place we wanted to go in terms of fighting the digital divide. Many people have become interested and invested in digital equity just in the past six months as it relates to COVID. We've been doing this for 10 years. We're, we've been pointing out this inequity for quite some time. And as our world has become increasingly digital, um, you know, people recognize there was a gap there, but what was a, a nice to have has become imperative for everyone. Um, and I think in this moment, we're just prepared to step up and, and do, do even more. 
Right. It's incredible that in these six months, it's become the difference between having an education and not having an education. Being Absolutely. Able to work, not being able to work. And in fact, Comcast has doubled down on this moment with a pledge to spend a hundred million over the next three years to combat racism and injustice. Um, that of course, the issues of, of digital inclusion also tie into. Uh, can you tell us more about how you're turning this pledge into action in your work? Absolutely. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is, you know, in, in the US, it took us 400 years to get here. Uh, the solutions are complex. Uh, what we need to learn in this moment and previous moments, there are no quick fixes here. And you really do need to start with, again, where you have expertise. And everyone needs to come to this space, you know, basically with a lot of humility and knowing that things have to be different when you get to the other side. So the, the first piece for us that was important is that this had to be an incremental investment. We didn't want to take away from some of the great work we were already doing um, to, to do this because we did feel like something more was needed in this moment. But we do want to look at everything we're doing across the spectrum, not just our philanthropy, but how we're treating our employees, how we're managing employees, acquiring employees, training them, et cetera. That's a big piece of it. You know, Comcast, any Fortune 50 company, I don't care how large you are, if you can't control, you know, kind of the environment in your own house, you'll have very little impact and credibility when it comes to helping communities outside. So that's a big piece of what we're doing, uh, making sure that our employees have safe spaces to raise concerns, to point out microaggressions, to learn about a variety of different cultures. We understand in this moment, the black community is hurting the most and probably is the one that that's talked about the most, but this is about all cultures um, and bringing everybody to the table and recognizing, you know, meeting them where they are, but challenging everybody to get to, to a new place. So it really started with employees for us, especially employees that were impacted by COVID, right? All of this was, was happening at the same time. I think the other piece is our media platform. We announced, um, you know, our, our head of news, Cesar Conde, announced that we would have at least 50% of our employees in news be people of color. A big part of media is representation who's telling the stories, who's doing the research, who's asking the questions. All of our perspectives matter, but if you're only showing one perspective, you're never getting the full story. As objective as news is, is supposed to be, journalism and journalists can really drive that story and create bias even when there is an intention to do that. So I think for us, it was important to diversify that base and working with different producers and directors when it comes to film or TV or a new platform, Peacock, um, partnering with directors like Ava DuVernay who focus on a different type of content um, and telling stories again from different perspectives. Making sure we're opening up our media platforms to do that is huge, as well as providing space for nonprofits to talk about different causes. Um, and again, in the past six months, you've seen more stories whether it's on, you know, front page of the newspaper, top of the morning news about digital equity. You know, everybody is quoting the stats about the millions of people that remain unconnected. And while everybody kind of knew that conceptually, I don't think they realized how many people weren't connected in urban markets, um, let alone rural markets, let alone around the world, and not being able to have that connectivity. And we think of that connectivity as a starting point, not an end point, um, is huge. And so we've focused a lot of our time and effort connecting 8 million people over the past 10 years and taking that learning to figure out what we need to do in this moment, partnering directly with school districts, with not-for-profit partners, Affordability is one piece, but you also need to make sure people have the appropriate equipment. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying, the appropriate digital literacy skills. Uh, and then making sure that people are, are empowered by technology. We're not looking to create another generation of, of tech consumers. We want people to be able to, to code, to have pathways to economic mobility. This is where the difference happens. The connectivity is just the starting point. Well, thank you for this very rich overview of, of all the possibilities. It's really incredible. And um, I, I love what you said. Connectivity is just the starting point. And I think, Lady Mariam, in your work as well, um, it is just the starting point. And it's, it's all about digital literacy and creating pathways for a future. Um, I also, 
notice that you are um, remarkable at building partnerships with UN and uh, governmental um, uh, agencies. I wonder if you can share a bit what strategies you've used uh, to do that and how these partnerships have helped you uh, scale your impact. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I really agree with everything um, you know, that I said. Um, you know, I really love what she said. It's true. The thing is, it wasn't it wasn't easy in the beginning to to be partner with them. But what what we did at I am the code, we had a mission. Uh, you know, from the beginning, um, you know, since the year two thousand, really, I've been chasing the, these people up. <laughs> you know, almost knocking doors and chasing them. You know, every single day, literally, I don't let them go. Um, and and it's it was mainly for accountability reasons because I wanted to make sure. You know, the fact that I was let down by society for for the fact that it was you know, really something they could have done better. Uh, you know, they could have given me connectivity. They could have made me safe in my village in Senegal. You know, they could have, you know, bought policies and laws in my country that, you know, uh, you know, prosecute uh, rapists and people who do bad things to girls, uh, you know, and, and build big schools and good schools so I can, I can be there. So it's almost like a vindication. So I said, okay, because you made mistakes in the past, now I'm gonna follow up with you until you do something right. So now I am an adult, uh, I can do it. I've got power and influence and I've got connections and, and platforms. I'm gonna go and tell everyone what you're doing wrong. <laughs> and so hopefully you can start, you know, correcting the mistakes you made in the past. And I think I started, I started that way. I started opening, writing open letters to, you know, big celebrities and, and, and government and, and really trying to get them to hear me. So I think sometimes we don't have the right platform because we do small things, uh, you know, People don't don't hear the stories, or there's no attention because we're not media and, and things like that. And then I think then I, I gave myself a mission in 2015. I said I am going to teach one million women and girls to learn how to code. And no one no one actually uh, you know they were doing the sustainable development goals. You know they were talking to each other, but no one actually took action. I said, well, if you're going to build the next pipeline of digital leaders, people who will be working in your company, coders, AI guys, you know, girls and boys who are decoding information today for you to have a business, you know, who are you going to hire? Are you going to hire just the same, uh, you know, the people who got opportunities and go into private schools or go into schools, or, you know, affordable schools, or are you going to also forget about the uh, marginalized communities? So at the end of the day, there's one planet, there's no two planets. So we, if we're going to talk about humanity and purpose and collectivity and working together, we need to think about everyone, not just the people that can afford this. So then I decided to create a multi-stakeholder approach where I get government, private sector, and investors to really advance sustainable development goals and advance tech education uh, by giving them concrete examples. And then, so this collaboration really is, is unique uh, for an organization like us. So, because we have the policy makers, which is government, businesses, they have money and they can fund us, you know, and storytellers like, uh, you know, uh, just like what I said earlier, you know, we have like filmmakers, you know, our stories, people don't know about them, but if you have storytellers writing our stories, documenting them, we're going to have all the girls across the world who will be inspired. So I really find out this approach and uh, it was working very well. So now we have really, you know, government, private sector, investors, philanthropy foundations, they all joined up uh, as a team with us, 27 company, uh, you know, have backed the, the data for the I am the code data, uh, you know, big banks and media personalities and have back the data because they can see uh, where we're going in 2030 because 2030 we're going to be sitting down at the UN when uh, you know they're all going back and forth to see these girls who said I learned how to code at I am the code when I was 11 years old now I'm 21 I want to get a job at Comcast or I want to get a you know I want to become an entrepreneur featured by uh, MIT Sob. so the more we think about this other you know visualize it and see this in the long term but make it local as well think about the girls these young girls they have nobody they were just like me wandering my my wandering around my street in Senegal uh, you know, until those bad things happen to me. Um, so it's really not good that we are sitting down and, and, and not taking care of people. Uh, and that's why the government, they are the policy makers. We cannot do anything without government. In my country, in Senegal, it took 50 years for my president, Macky Sall, to promulgate the law of uh, abortion and, and, and for, for rapists to go to jail because it's a Muslim country, we, we, they, molest, they molest children. And so no one says anything. 
but the, the hurt and the pain is so bad for girls and boys growing up across this world. If you open your eyes a little bit, you'll see it's not just Senegal, but it's across the world. And we are building uh, pain and difficulty for people who could actually have really easy life. I could have had a really easy life because the background where I come from, this didn't happen, but it happened to my mother and it happened to us. So that, that's why I really I'm trying today to bring this multi-stakeholder approach where uh, I get every single person involved and tell them this is what you need to do. This is your task. If you want to see in 2030 a good success story from an African continent and see girls being healthy and mentally healthy, have their well-being being taken care of, people investing in them. Because if you invest now, uh, 10 years, you'll see the return on investment. But if you don't invest in the girls now, and who's going to be coding your website 10 years from now? So don't come to me 10 years and say, Mariam, I don't have coders uh, because they're, they're, they're white, they're not black. No, you need to invest now, you know, in the black community, in, in diversity. It doesn't just have to be black people, but invest in girls globally now. And in 2030, you see the result. Then it takes 10 years sometime for things to happen. And now we have a massive opportunity uh, here with COVID-19 to invest in people because COVID-19 has showed the equalizer. We are all the same. We're all suffering. We all are, you know, everything has moved from, you know, back and forth from into our lives. So if we start investing now, we see the results in 2030. So that's my goal, really. Thank you. And it's a, it's a, it's a serious alarm bell you're ringing, regardless of religion, governments are failing um, uh, girls uh, and, and little boys everywhere, especially in this moment of, um, uh, of pandemic. And so uh, we really, you know, that, that's a big message. There's also a really nice takeaways for entrepreneurs. And there are many of us uh, in, in the audience about being relentless, having big ambitious goals and modeling and telling the story that you want to see become history. Um, so these these are, these are really nice takeaways. Thank you for that, Mariam. Uh, incredulously, we're out of time almost. So I'm going to uh, let the last word to Delilah. If you had a call to action uh, to our audience, what would it be? And uh, I know we have a very exciting partnership coming up. So I also want to make sure you had a chance to share that with, with everyone. Sure. I mean, in terms of call to action, um, I think what I want to say for everybody is, you know, every moment is an opportunity for us to, to, to move where we are forward. And it can be overwhelming where we are right now with all the social unrest and it can be discouraging. Um, but I think it's just important for everybody to think about that one thing they can do different, that one idea that they can push forward and supporting the people around them and having empathy while you do that. Um, so uh, don't get discouraged, fight through this moment. Um, we can get past it, uh, but we need to get past it together. Uh, it's not something that any of us can do, to, can do alone. I think part of that, that magic, you know, we're seeing it in this moment, often when there's a, a crisis like this, people come together, they think of new ways to collaborate. Um, MIT Solve has this incredible record of, you know, crowdsourcing and funding different ideas and people that are close to the, the problem, but really want to dig in with technology and innovation on a solution. So we're excited, excited to be one of the, the early funders of a new US focused racial justice initiative challenge that will be launched next year that will cover a number of different areas uh, where we know technology and innovation and, and social entrepreneurship can have an incredible impact. So we're proud to be at that table with you. We are so proud to have you as our partner and so excited to get the work going. Uh, Lady Marianne, this won't be the last time we talk either. Um, I'm so grateful for your time, for your insight, for your passion. Please continue pushing the envelope for all of us and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.